rolling here. We've got kind of a lot to talk about. Who would have, who would have thought? All righty. All right, Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Romans chapter 9. Let's see here. I'm one. I'll start back at verse number 11. Okay. Verse number 11. Romans chapter 9. Verse 11. For the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand, not of works, but of him that calleth. All right, now, from our study with election, almost every time the word election shows up in the Bible, does anybody remember what's, it, what's it's usually associated with? Election, Jordan? Uh, usually, whatever. Okay, usually the Jews. That's a good one. That's one. What, what else? What's another one? Service. That's good. The Jews in service. That, that word election shows up almost all the time. You'll see and find in the context, Jews or service. you got to get that. Um, same with the word calling. Okay, it has to deal with service. Okay, look down to verse number 12. And it was said unto her, the elder shall serve the younger. So there you go. There's some context right there about this election stuff. The elder shall serve the younger. Verse 13, as it is written, okay, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. And you get a lot of Calvinists, they love that verse. They always run in that verse, you know. You know, see, you know, he, he hated Esau and stuff. Okay, I understand that. But who's, you know, who's Jacob? Jacob's Israel. Who's Esau in the Bible? Esau is represented of Edom, the nation of Edom. Okay, if you go look at Genesis chapter 25, verse 23, there were two nations inside of the womb of Rebekah, Israel and Edom. Now, God hated Esau. Okay, why did he hate Esau? Because Esau despised his birthright. Okay. That's why. God didn't make Esau despise his birthright. Esau chose. He, he chose the flesh. Uh, just give me a pot of chili or some, you know, feed my flesh, I need, and then I'll give you the birthright. Okay? Um, it wasn't that God predestinated, you know, foreordained for the foundation of the world that Esau was going to despise his birthright. There was always condition. Okay? Let's come down to verse number 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Is there unrighteousness with God? God forbid. Now, if you're a Calvinist, yeah, there is unrighteousness with God, okay? Imagine God sending a baby to hell. God sending a child, an innocent child, to hell. That goes against the very nature of God, of being a just, holy, righteous God. He's going to send a baby. Let's say even a baby in the womb, okay, that thing in miscarriages or whatever, and it, and it wakes up in torments, in fire, because he wasn't elected before the foundation of the world. You have elect and non-elect babies. From, I mean, think about that. It goes against the very nature of God. If you're a Calvinist, yeah, then there is unrighteousness with God. That's why Calvinism is a deep, dark, scary thing, you know, the, the God of Calvinism. Uh, there's Baal worshipers, okay, in the Old Testament that were worshiping Baal. And what were they doing? They were sacrificing their kids unto Molech, okay? They were sacrificing their kids unto the devil. And the Lord says in Jeremiah chapter 32, verse 35, uh, you know, they built high places to Baal, and they caused their sons to pass through the fire unto Molech, which I commanded them not. Okay, God commanded them not. Neither came it into my mind. The Lord didn't even think of such a thing. Neither came it into my mind that they should do this abomination to cause Judah to sin. Then God and everyone would have thought of that they were going to take an innocent child, sacrifice that thing into the, fl into the flame to the devil. Yet a Calvinist, a full-blown Calvinist, when you pin them down, a full-blown Calvinist will look you dead in the eye and say, yeah, some babies are burning in hell. I mean, that's, that's pretty wicked. That God didn't, he wouldn't even have thought of thing pass, passing that baby into the fire, let alone God allowing that child to burn in the lake of fire for eternity. Okay? That's crazy. So is there unrighteousness with the God of Calvinism? Well, there sure is. Look at verse number 15. For he saith to Moses... I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Now, how did they, okay, you know, how did they under the Old Testament, before the cross, 
before the new birth, before spiritual circumcision, before the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, how did they obtain mercy in the Old Testament? They had to obey what God said. Let's keep it simple like that. They had to obey what God told them to do, okay, the law and all that. You had to obey what God told them to do. And if they obeyed, if they obeyed what God told them to do, then what? Then God would show them mercy. If they didn't obey, God wouldn't show them mercy, okay? Now, um, now notice that there. They, you, received the, you received the mercy and compassion of God based upon conditional clauses. That's something you got to know. Um, now, right, look at Romans chapter 9, verse 16. So then, it is not of him that willeth, not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God, but of God that showeth mercy. Okay, you can't will yourself or you can't do whatever you think to get God's mercy. You can't work whatever, whatever work you think. You, I can't just go and pray five hours a day, okay? I can't just go over to make a pilgrimage to Mecca or I can't go meditate. You know, whatever I, whatever I think my will is, I'm, that's how I'm going to have mercy with God. You have to have mercy according to God's will, okay? It has to be God. You know, how did God will for somebody to have mercy during this present dispensation? Well, obviously, by faith in the gospel. 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 2, and I've got to turn there, but talks about um, receiving mercy through, uh, through faith, okay, through the faith. Now, how do we obtain mercy and compassion of God today? Okay, how do we obtain mercy? Is by obeying what God tells us to do. There was a verse over there, I think, in Romans chapter 10, if you want to flip the page real quick, keep a hand in Romans 9. Romans chapter 10, verse 16, but they have not all obeyed the gospel. Okay, they have not all obeyed the gospel. Now, many people try tying that into works. Well, see, so you got to do certain things in order to stay saved or do certain things to get saved. Obeying the gospel is doing the will of the Father, which is believe on him whom he hath sent. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, thou shalt be saved. Look at Romans chapter 10. Look at verse, you know, verses 9 through 13. You, you, you can go through all that thing. Look at verse number 13. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Whosoever, it's, in, it's inclusive, okay? It's not just for the elect. Okay, obeying, that's obeying the gospel, calling upon the Lord, believing in the heart, confessing with the mouth on the salvation. That's obeying the gospel. Okay, come down back to Romans 9, 17. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. I always like that because there was no scripture before, before while Pharaoh was going. It was God said it. You know, this is before Moses never had it. But notice the word scripture is almost used in place of the, of the Lord. I mean, many, many people get in, well, you King James Bible believers, you're a bunch of bibliologists. You, you worship and idolatrize the King James Bible and all that. Well, Paul said, the scripture saith, Paul says he ascribed personal characteristics to the scripture and put the scripture in the place of the Lord. Just like David said, for thou hast magnified thy word above all thy name. David, you know, you call David a bibliographer or bibliologer and stuff like that. But it's, it's just an interesting clause there, though. For the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Now, listen. Even for the same purpose have I raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Okay, so now listen, God used Pharaoh. Okay, he used Pharaoh, and I mean, even if, you know, even if Pharaoh was disobedient, he used Pharaoh, and Pharaoh really didn't even know it. God's power was being manifest through Pharaoh, in a sense. Okay, now God hardened Pharaoh's heart because Pharaoh hardened his own heart. Okay, let's look real quick. I don't want to get hung up on this too long, but look at Exodus. Look at Exodus chapter 8. Exodus chapter 8. And I'll announce the title of, of the message in a minute here. Ex uh, Exodus chapter number 8. Exodus chapter number 8. Look at verse number 15. Exodus chapter 8, verse 15. God hardened Pharaoh's heart because... Pharaoh hardened his heart. Now, I'd write these verses down. This is something you got to get. You ever run across the Calvinist? This is what they always go to. It's out of him that willeth, and you know all this stuff about you know God's et eternal decrees and all this, all this you know philosophical terms that they use that aren't found in the Bible even. But look at Exodus chapter eight, verse number fifteen. But but when Pharaoh saw that there was respite, he hardened his heart, and hearkened not unto them, as the Lord had said. Pharaoh didn't listen. He didn't obey what God said. Let my people go. That was the will of God. Pharaoh didn't let his people go. What does it say? Pharaoh hardened his heart. All right, look, look at verse number 32. And Pharaoh, 
after all those miracles, God's showing his power. Verse 32, and Pharaoh hardened his heart. At this time also, neither would he let the people go. Okay, then you get, you, that's then you next thing you keep reading. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. So, well, how do you reconcile the two? Okay, well, number one, Pharaoh hardened his heart, and God, and God hardened his heart. Okay, so they, the, it's, not just, it's not just the will of man, and it's not just the will of God. There's both. That's, they're, they're both. Okay, there's, there's two involved. It's not just all man, and it's not just all God. It's both. Come back to Romans 9. Romans 9.20. Romans 9, 20, he says, Nay, but, O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay? The reason why we sung that song. Okay? Hath not the potter power over the clay? Have thine own way, Lord. That's why I like that, that hymn that we sung there. Of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor. All right, now in that context, the, the vessel of dishonor is who? Who could you guess? It'd be Pharaoh, the vessel of dishonor. That's under the Old Testament. Yeah, that's another thing you got to get. Now, God used Pharaoh and hardened his heart because Pharaoh hardened his heart and would not obey what God, what God uh, would not obey the men of God or what God said. Now, under New Testament salvation, I think, I believe we read the verse in 2 Timothy chapter 2 where it says, if you purge yourself from these, you shall be a vessel unto honor. So, number one, you gotta, you got to understand the difference of Old Testament salvation and New Testament salvation. So many operations happen to a New Testament child of God that did not happen in the Old Testament child of God. So, you got to get, get that down. Now, the topic I want to discuss tonight isn't a deep theological, uh, you know, theological dissertation or whatever against Calvinism. We'll, we'll pick up that whole thing, you know, sometime later on, which I still got to um, still got to finish the rest of those. But uh, we'll get to that. That, that. There's been on my heart, you know, recently with the, this whole Calvinism stuff and babies burning in hell and all this. This is it's wickedness. I mean, it's absolutely disgusting. That's a that's a heresy. No doubt about it. But we'll dig into the doctrinal dissertation of this passage probably when we get into our Roman study, whenever that may be. Um, now, uh, what I want to preach on here tonight is, is on the subject, I don't know what to title it, but I would probably title it Questioning God. That'd be something that we could title it, Questioning God, okay? Questioning God. Now, you know, it's interesting because I, I get all, most of my sermons that I get or most of my topics that I get at nighttime, I get at nighttime when I'm laying on my bed half asleep. So if my, if my sermons ever seem jumbled up and they're all over the place, it's probably because I'm in that state of mind where I'm like, you know, a, a verse just comes into my head. You know, like, just out, out of nowhere. I believe that's the Holy Spirit of God in a, in a quiet stillness. You know, there's nothing better than at, the, at a long days of whatever you're doing, occupying your mind with so much stuff. It just rests in your head upon the pillow. And the last thing you want to be thinking about is God. That's a beauty. I love it. It's, a, it's beautiful. And, the, and then I got to wake up. I got to turn. I usually text myself all kinds of notes or whatever and try to get somewhat of a bullet point outline. In, or just text a topic or something, and then I'll do some studying and researching on it throughout the week and all. But, um, you know, I'm reading the book of Psalms, too, and, and David, did, he said even, when I remember thee, upon, Psalm 63, verse 6 is a good verse. Psalm 63, 6, David says, when I remember thee upon my bed. That's a great thing. Remember God when you're laying down on your bed. And meditate on thee in the night watches, you know. And that's crazy. A lot, of, a lot of things I did get from God and learning about God, and I had time, just me by myself sitting in the basement, just sitting there literally during my college time, sitting there till 4 or 5 a.m. in the morning, <laughs> just staying up all night and going to class, you know, 10 a.m., 9 a.m., or whatever, if I even made it. <laughs> but whatever, you know, a lot of time was in the night watches. The Lord, I think that stuff's a blessing, but you know, it's, it's interesting. The Lord, you know, lays certain things on your heart. I'm sure he may do that for, you know, you all during... The, during the nighttime, the stillness, the quietness. There's something about that. Now, what I want to look at, look at Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Look at Romans chapter 9, verse 20. Verse 20 and 21. Nay, but O man, who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Hath not the potter power over the clay of the same lump to make one vessel unto honor and another unto dishonor? 
Now, okay, those two verses, that's what I want to zone in for this evening, okay? I want to see what we can get from the Lord from those two verses. We're going to look at them. There's three questions that are found there. Who art thou that repliest against God? Who art thou that repliest against God? Why hast thou made me thus? And hath not, and hath not the potter power over the clay? Okay? Now, hath not the potter power over the clay? Now, it's interesting, you know, the answer is found within the, within the verse. Um, you know, hath not the power potter, uh, uh, hath not the potter power over the clay? Now, um, you know, what power do we got? When you think about it, we're all just a piece of clay. We're all a piece of clay. And we were, we were all brought forth, I think, like what it says there, um, verse number uh, 21, the same lump. Okay, we were all brought forth out of the same lump of, of clay. And, uh, you know, did you, ever, did you ever just think about man and woman? Man, God brought forth from the dust of the ground. For he knew in his nostrils. Man came living soul and all that. Next thing you know, uh, the woman shows up from the rib. And I believe that's why maybe us men don't really mind too much dirt and grit and grime and stuff. We, we came directly from the dirt, okay? But the woman, uh, well, you came, you were aside, you came from us. You came from a rib. But don't, don't get too crazy because I do believe still that you, you women came from a bunch of mud also. I don't know if God just took that rib that spare rib or whatever, and just, just you know, made a, a woman out of it. I'm still thinking he partook of that clay, okay? So you still got that nature in you, too. Don't get thinking you're all, you know, ditzy and you don't want to break a nail or nothing like that. Now, I still think you got that nature in you. You came from clay. Now, I want to just think about this. You know, everybody sitting in this room, we came from a, a lump of clay. We came from the same lump. That's, a, that's interesting. You look around, you know, we look around everyone, and you, you scratch, and there's dust flying around, floating in there. A whole bunch of balls of dirt, a bunch of dirt balls in here. When you think of that, a bunch of dirt balls. Okay, you know I love you all. all right? I love you all, but we're at the end. They were just a bunch of dirt balls. That's something we gotta we gotta think about. Now that's a humbling thought when I think about that. Now who art thou? Okay, that repliest against God. Well, who are you? All right. Well, we we just said it. We're just a bunch of balls of dirt. That's who we are. That's what we are. Um, you know, and, and if you want to get a little more of a joy behind that, you're not just a ball of dirt, but you're a sinful ball of dirt at best. Okay, so you're a cursed piece of ground. That's where we come down from at the end of the day. We're, we're, we're cursed now. Now, that, you know, you think, well, isn't that just wonderful, really? <laughs> well, you know, that's great. You know, but, well, people say, well, you know, I make six figures and, you know, I'll, I'm the richest man. I'm, well, it don't matter. You're still, uh, still a dirt ball at the end of the day, and you're still <laughs> sinful. Okay, you still, it don't matter what happens, you, and here it gets even better, not only you're a dirt ball, not only you're a sinful dirt ball, but then the, here's the catch, then you go back down into the dirt again. It's from, the Bible says, from dust thou art, and dust thou shalt return. So there's something we got to think about is, well, who, who, who are you? Who art thou that, were, that you reply against God? And I'm just a dirt ball. I'm just a, just a speck, just a speck of, speck of dust. Now you think about that for a little, and, um, you know, and I, I think about some other things, and I'm like, man, Lord, you know, we're just a dirt ball. We're just a bunch of just sinful dirt balls. We're going to go down in the dust again, dust thou art, and all that. But then I think about it within the, you know, the Lord. Well, thank God there's an incorruptible seed planted inside that dirt ball that one day is going to sprout up to be a glorified body one day. So there's some, you know, shouting, jumping and stuff that we could have some, you know, a blessing actually found in that. Now, you know, when you get to replying against God, replying against God, you get on some grounds of self-righteousness, okay? For people that reply against God, let's look at the, real quick look at the book of Job. Job, it's a fascinating book, look at the book of Job. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Job chapter 38. Now, we're not going to go through these whole chapters here. But look at Job chapter 38. Right now, we're just zoning in on the question. Who art thou that repliest against God? Who are you? What are we? Okay. Look at Job chapter 38, though. Look at this. Uh, let's see here. Job chapter 38, the Lord enters the conversation. All right. Then the Lord answered Job out of a whirlwind. Who is this that, darken, that darkeneth counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up thy loins like a man. For I will demand of thee and answer thou me. I always like that. Gird up your loins like a man and answer God. You know, you want to think you're so big and bad, you, you know, answer God. Answer these questions. He's, God's going to give you a test. He's going to give these people a test. 
I don't care. You take the smartest dirt ball in your in your high school. You take the smartest dirt ball in your college. Take Elon Musk. Take the smartest man on this planet, and try to get a hundred percent on this test. You know that guy in your call in your high school. You got a hundred percent on the AT, SAT or something like that. Whatever. Okay, that's that's great. Good knowledge and all. But try answering all these questions here that God's about to ask somebody to come from a lump of clay here. Look at verse four. Where was thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare. If thou hast understanding. Well, obviously we weren't around. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Every single measurement. I don't believe just the circumference or whatever of the earth. or, I mean, every square inch of this place. I mean, that'd be kind of hard to figure out. The square footage of even, of even all this, of all the whole planet. And crevice and valley. Who hath stretched the line upon it, wherever the foundation is fastened? Who hath shut up the sea with, the do uh, with doors? So it break forth as if it had issued out of the womb. If you want to get closest to hell, you probably go below the sea. Eventually you'll see doors. You read the book of Jonah. There, hell got gates. Gates of hell? Well, I don't know. That stuff's probably down at the very bottom of the ocean. Nobody ever found that yet, though. I made a cloud as the garment, um, thick dark swad uh, swaddling band for it, and break it up in my decreed place, and set bars and doors. Okay, that's interesting. And said, Hitherto thou shalt come no further. I shall come no further. I believe they tried, they tried drilling into hell at one point in time under whoever's presidency. Anybody remember that time? Anybody's president, they tried actually drilling down into the earth to see if they would ever, you know, hit hell. And they never found it. Then they had to fake some video of the screens in hell over there in Russia or whatever. You know, just to, because people want to operate by sight and, and hearing and their senses rather than just, just what God's book says. Uh, Hast thou commanded the morning since the days and caused the day spring to know his place? No way. That it might take hold of the ends of the earth. He goes on and on with, with all these, you know, verse 22. Hast thou entered into the treasures of the snow? Treasures of the snow, I wouldn't have known that. But supposedly, you know, you can read Dr. Ruckman's title or note on that. About there's nitrates or something like that and compressed snow. That there's money that can be found in snow if you extract certain compounds or chemical compounds from it. I don't know. I had no idea about that. Or hast thou seen the treasures of hail? Which, look at this which I have reserved against the time of trouble. God reserved these hailstones coming down, 70, 70 talents or whatever. There's going to plummet planet Earth one day. God knows about them. Uh, we never see nothing like that. Who hath divided the waters? He goes on. Look over, you know, verse 33. Can thou knowest the ordinances of heaven? Who can, num who can number the clouds in wisdom? Or who can stay the bottles of heaven? And only God can do such things. You know, then, then verse 39 um, verse 39, uh, he goes on kind of with, with the same stuff. Look at verse number, I don't know, let's see, let's verse number, um, uh, verse number 20, Job 39, 20. Canst thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He goes talking about animals and stuff. He mocketh at fear and is not affrightened. What animal is he talking about here? He's talking about a, an ostrich or something, a peacock, an ostrich eggs. Um, you go through and you read them chapters on your own time, and you start seeing how you, you you know how you score on that test right there. Try to answer those things. You can't. Okay, you're going to have a hard time. Now come to Matthew real quick. Look at this verse in Matthew. I want us to think about this. Look at Matthew chapter 12. Look at Matthew 12:36. Who art thou that repliest against God? Look at Matthew chapter 12, verse 36. Now imagine this. Matthew 12. Look at verse number 36. It's the Lord Jesus Christ speaking. Look what he says here. Matthew 12, 36. Matthew 12, 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that man shall speak, they shall give account thereof in the day of judgment. Every idle word that man shall speak. There's going to come a time where every single person, well, how, well why did you, you know, reject that preacher? Or why did you reject this tract that was handed to you? Why, why didn't you... You know, geez, in this day and age, why didn't you finish watching that YouTube video, you know, or something to, to get that gospel invitation? Or why did you reject the, my, my words at the end of the day? You had time and time. People had time and opportunity to receive the grace of God, and they, they want nothing to do uh, nothing to do with it. And um, uh, another thing, you know, it's interesting, idle words. Idle word, okay? And what that idle means is meaningless. Why did you spend so much time talking about a bunch of junk? Things that were absolutely meant nothing. Every idle word. Well, why'd you spend so much time kidding around and joking around all the time? Causing all these jokes and stuff. And 
and, and just going off and telling all these stories and every idle word, meaningless word. Why didn't you spend so much breath that I gave you, that God gave you, and, and you just did nothing but boast about, you know, talk about the talk about the news media and politics and, and just, you know, the, the car I got and the house I got and the, the, the money I got stashed up in the bank and just all, you used all your tongue and, and all this stuff. Okay, and, and you never one time glorify. You never use that tongue to, to glorify your creator. Okay, and uh, you, that's something to think about. Every idle word, meaning the meaningless words. Now, the Bible says, okay, in uh, Romans 9, in that chapter there, who art thou that replies against God? Now, you think about it, that's the creation, the balls of clay, the creation replying against the creator. Okay, uh, they accuse the creator. Accuse him of being unjust and unfair and, and, you know, don't give me opportunities or whatever. People accuse the creator. Um, they slander the creator. They, they mock him. They scoff him. They spit in his face. You know, he came down into the world. The world didn't even know who he was. That was God manifested in the flesh. They killed him. Um, and they, what do they do? They, they, at the end of the day, they, most of them, they tell him, I don't need God. I don't need God. I, I, you know, I'm, you know, I'm. I'm myself, and uh, they set up their own God and stuff. And But it's interesting. Most of those people, they dare not speak against their own political party. <laughs> they get so into this big boat about Republican and Democrat, and they don't want to say, not, if I'm wrong, I'm a diehard right, left, right Republican. I don't want to say nothing wrong about my party. Don't you dare talk about my party. <laughs> it's like, what a joke. Talk about the, you know, they dare not speak against their political party. Another person, you know, they dare not speak against the Pope. You speak against the Pope, a Catholic will go nuts. Okay, you speak against the pope. They don't speak against the pope. Uh, they dare not. They dare not speak against their government. They think the government's out for their best interest. I'm sure you can see a lot of people in this day and age thinking, well, "Why would the government do something like that? Why would they poison me? Why would they give me all this, make this, make this flu and create this va in this vaccine and create this, this COVID? Well, why would they do that to me? They love me. <laughs> they care about me. They have their best. They got. I'm. I'm. I'm you know, they got their be my best interest at heart. The government. They dare not speak against the government. That's nuts. Because think, they're quick to side with Caesar before they are the true king. Forget about the words of that book and how the, all this stuff is going to happen. I'm going with what the, what the government tells me. They don't speak against that. Atheists, okay, is another one. Atheists will try to reply against God by denying his existence, pretty much. They deny that he even exists. And you don't have to, uh, if you're in the book of Romans, you could look at this verse again. Romans chapter 1, verse 22. Romans chapter 1, verse 22, the atheists reply against God, okay? A lot of people reply, they just reply against the creator. Now look at Romans chapter 1, look at verse number 22. Professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools. Professing themselves to be wise and they became fools. I'm a college professor and, you know, we believe in, in you know, at the end of the day, they don't believe in no morals. They don't believe in no absolutes. Everything's all relative. Your truth is different than my truth. That's what they, they teach relativity and all that. And that's a God-forsaken doctrine being taught in public schools. No absolute truth, no morals. Throw it out, whatever pleases your flesh, whatever pleases you. Professing themselves to be wise. They talk about animals and the protecting the environment and going green. And they think that they're wise with it. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools and changed the, and changed the glory of the uncorruptible God into an image made like corruptible man. So they change the God of the uncorruptible God into an image that's just like us, you know, setting themselves up as God. Whatever I think is, is right, that's what's right. You know, every man did that which was right in his own eyes in the book of Judges. And how'd that thing fare out in the book of Judges? <laughs> Not too well. People were hacking up people and sending them across the, the country. It was, a me it was a mess in the book of Judges. And that's something Judges, and them guys didn't know how to judge. Why? Because they forsook the words of the Lord. You don't find the book of the Lord anywhere in the book of Judges. <laughs> which that's how we're supposed to be judging things by. But Psalms chapter 14, which we should all know that one. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. The fool said in his heart. And Paul, Paul had the Psalms. He read that verse. He knew that verse. That's why probably he was inspired to write, professing themselves to be fools or professing themselves to be wise, they became as fools because they, be, well, they were atheists. Atheism just wasn't a thing in modern era. That thing, that atheism been around with philosophers and all that stuff. Uh, look at Titus. I like this verse in Titus. Titus chapter 1, verse 15. Look at this. Atheists, they're trying to reply against God with, with jokes or, you know, snarling, you know, sarcastic remarks and, 
you know, um, they're trying to reply against God, a dirt ball. The one that, you know, and God has grace, man. God has mercy even against those people. He still feeds them, still gives them breath. He could kill them on the spot if he wanted to. Look at Titus chapter 1, verse 15. I like this verse. Titus 1, 15. Unto the pure, all things are pure. But unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, that would be an atheist, is nothing pure. Now, there's nothing pure to an atheist. Like I said, there's no absolutes to atheism. There's no good or evil. That's scary. There's no good or evil no more. Okay, and under the pure, all things are pure. Unto them that are defiled and unbelieving, there is nothing pure, but even their mind and their conscience is defiled. Their mind and conscience gets defiled. Now, here's where I want to put the finger and point all at everybody sitting here is, okay, we looked at some groups of people. Have you ever replied against God? Have you ever replied against God? Now, we're going to look at the next question. Look at, come back to the book of Romans chapter 9. Look at the next question. Look at the next question here. And you say, yeah, there's, there's God forsaken atheists. They're all going to go to hell. We, you know, well, I'll forget them. And, you know, yeah, this world's messed up. The government don't know what they're doing. We don't, the whole world, the Democrats don't know what they're doing. And, you know, all, all this stuff. And people say, okay, I can understand that, you know. I, but here's, here's the thing. Have you ever replied against God? Look, look at this right here. Romans chapter 9. Look at verse number uh Verse number 20. Who art thou that repliest against God? Shall the thing that formed it say to him that for, shall, shall the thing formed, the piece of dirt, the clay, say to him that formed it, why hast thou made me thus? Why did you make me this way? Did you ever ask that to God? You're replying against God. You got to think about that, okay? You know, you get, get in a, a, a lot, you know, why, why, well, why was I born into this broken home? Why was I born with a, with a mom and dad all, all hooked out and strung out on drugs? Why was I born in a violent childhood? Why was I born in a, why, why was my child, it was, you know, somebody said, why was my child born crippled? What, 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 um, what's that one? He can't even eat, he got a, he's on a feeding tube his whole life. Can't do nothing. Well, why was my child born like this? Or why was I born with some certain health issue or something like that? Or, um, you know, well, you know what, why, why? Why was this certain situation in my life? Why? And you think about that. That's in a sense to ask, telling God, replying against God. Why did I get dealt the hand that you dealt me with? You know, you, and people, Christians, a lot of people, everybody is guilty of that. Why, why did you, why, why hast thou made me thus? You think about that question. And, um, you know, tall people, you know, tall people, uh, sometimes they want to be short. They hit their head off everything. You know, short people, sometimes they want to be tall. I wish I could dunk a basketball or something. You know, you know, fat people, oh, I wish I was skinny and stuff. And skinny people, we sometimes wish we were big people or something, you know. And, you know, skinny little people, oh, I wish I had muscles. I wish I was chiseled out like this and all that. And, you know, they get to, well, well, why are they make me like this? You know, they're getting them. I studied that working out stuff for a little bit. They got the, what are you, uh, you're like the the middle guy, the echomorph, mesomorph. You know, oh, I'm, I'm stupid. I'm a little echomorph or whatever. It, I have to work twice as hard as you. And. Then big, you know, big guys that are easy to put on muscle mass and people start getting discouraged. People start, you know, looking at everybody and, um, you know, nowadays, you know, you got, you know, all this race confusion and stuff. And uh, that's a whole other thing now. You get even farther than that. You got ge gender confusion. They don't know. Why is that? I mean, why did you make me a, 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 a guy? And, next, and I'm, a, I'm a girl. I'm telling you, I'm a girl. <laughs> Just believe, you know, I mean, why? And they, they re that's a big time, re obviously, replying against God. But they do it with their, with their personalities even. You know, some people are just introverted. Some people are extrovert. And the extrovert says, why, why wasn't I, an, why can't I just be an, an introvert and be serious-minded like some of the brethren, you know, just real stern and serious and seem like they got good wisdom. And, you know, maybe sometimes extroverts look at the introverts like that. And then the introverts, why ain't I loud and shouting and running around the aisles and jumping on the pews and banging the pulpit? And people start looking around, even in, within Christian circles and stuff. So personality traits why hast thou made me thus that's what people ask you know obviously for you ladies you know why why did i get born with brown hair i wanted blonde hair and so they dye their hair 50 shades of whatever you know why did you why, why wasn't i redhead or why you know i got curly hair and why didn't i have straight hair and i have straight hair and i wish i had curly hair and i mean come on that's what that's what ladies you know probably get all banged up about and stuff and it goes on and on with how how people look and 
in skin complexion and skin color and tones and you know far so you know I think the older you get the less you kind of care about how you look and you know how you smell and how you do things I mean it gets maybe not that much I mean you all still feel, it feels like man I just got off work <laughs> but you, you get what I'm saying though People, you get older you kind of like you know get all that you know little child stuff but in high school younger kids man Younger people, they look at that, they, that bangs them up. That bangs them up, and it gets a kind of a, a bitterness, a complexion. Why hast thou made me thus, Lord? You know, and, and that's something that we, we got to look at. And I like to think of just a couple happy happy things here is, uh, you know, there's a you. There's a you sitting here because God needed you for some reason, okay? Um, you know, nobody, everybody sitting in this room, nobody got eyes like you have. Everybody got different eye color. It, everybody's different. That's a blessing. Nobody got eyes like you. Nobody got a voice like you. Nobody got a mind like you. I don't care if it's wacky or backwards or whatever. Nobody got a mind like you. Another good thing, you know, nobody else in this world has the plan that God has for you and you only. Everybody else has a, God has a plan for everybody, and your plan's different. And he has a plan for you and you only when you think about it. Um, so that, there's, that's some, there's some good things with that. And uh, the, the troubling the trouble with replying against God by saying, why did you make me thus? Why hast thou made me thus? Is because you kind of get on like a high horse that, well, I deserve better. I deserve better, God. You put me through this situation. I was growing up in the, in the ghettos, and that's why I'm raised like this. And I was molested as a kid, and that's why I'm just so wicked and warped and twisted. And, you know, I had, I had violence and drugs, drug addicts in my family. So now you get, I get hardened to those people. I don't want nothing to do with them, a bunch of low-life junkies. Get out of my face and stuff. People, that you got to watch out for that. How why hast thou made me thus and put in, in situations in your life and things? God got reason for all that. You might not be able to figure it out and see it right now. God got a reason for for all that stuff going on. And you stay and you when you get that type of attitude that, like we said, almost like a self righteousness type of attitude. You know why hast thou made, you're on like a high horse thinking you deserve better. Okay, when what do you mean? We're we're, we're spoiled rotten, spoiled rotten. And we deserve better. <laughs> Why'd you make? Why am I like it? Why this the? And that's why, in a way, maybe I'm a little deep and dark and twisted. But if things do get bad and pop off, I think maybe some of us may be better off because we get real close to God. Some of us were completely fall. They wouldn't know what to do at all. But some of us be like, finally, thank God, we can start worrying about things that we need to worry about. Give us this day our daily bread. You know, give forgive us our trespasses. And thank God for shelter. I make a a hut in the middle of the woods or something or. You may be, you know, a little bit more appreciative of some things if that if stuff really gets gets bad. Some of us might need a slap over the head with that. But you now another guy I look at it, look, you know, you take the Apostle John, the Apostle John. I look at P Apostle John. He's like, I believe sometimes he was the only spiritual disciple of them all. You know, Apostle John. You know, the rest of them they were all, you know, bickering and fussing about who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom, who's going to be the greatest, who's going to sit at thy right hand and. And all that, you know, they're all, are, are all arguing about who's the greatest. And then they, they got the Apostle John resting on the bosom of Jesus, you know, because he knew he knew who was the greatest. You know, he knew who was the greatest already resting on his bosom. Everybody's arguing and fussing. And, you know, then, then it's interesting, though, as you get to the book of Acts and John, he, he don't the book of Acts, that big, tremendous history book of early of the early church. And John isn't really mentioned much. You know, you got Peter, Peter, a big character, you know. Peter, man, that guy was like a yo-yo half the time. He's up and down. He's up and down. One day he's walking on the water. Next he's sinking. One day, you know, he's gripping up the Lord and rebuking the Lord. You know, be it far from me, Lord. You know, next day he's asking all these crazy questions, and the Lord always took his time to answer him. Or one day he's pulling out his sword and cutting somebody's ear off. And I mean, Peter was a character, but, but Peter, Jesus Christ gave him the keys of the kingdom of heaven. I mean, that's pretty big, the keys of the kingdom of heaven. And he used that. I don't get a big doctrinal thing here, but he used them to open up a door for the Jew and Gentile. And God revealed to Peter first before Paul even came on the scene that I'm going to go back. I'm going to start saving the Gentiles and stuff in the book of Acts chapter 10 and all that. But you hear a lot about Peter. You know, John kind of fades off the scene for a little bit. And, uh, and then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden, God uses somebody to replace Peter. He uses Paul, a guy that was killing and murdering the church. And God said, yeah, that's the guy right there. I want him, and I'm going to give him all the doctrines of the church age. You've got to follow that guy. <laughs> I mean, Peter, I mean, I mean, really. And I don't, I don't see Peter bickering and arguing and saying, Lord, why did you do this like that? You picked Paul, a guy who was out there killing you, murdering you. 
You know, I don't see one time where Peter ever asked that question, why hast thou made me thus? You know, and uh, he might have gotten a little, he might have gotten a little argument with Paul at the feast in Galatia with that little hypocrisy and all that, but that was another thing. But, um, you know, there's just a couple couple characters that I think about that could, could have asked, like Peter, he could have asked that question, why hast thou made me thus? And asking all these whys and all of this, but he didn't. Now look, at here's another thing. Here's something that really gets people in trouble about this whole, why hast thou made me thus? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number Mm. I'll find it somewhere in there. There we go. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. Here's what gets people tr in trouble. And they start asking that question. And now keep in mind, that's a reply against God. It's not a good thing. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 2, verse number 10. Well, 2 Corinthians chapter 12. I'm sorry. I don't know where I'm at. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse number 12. Look at this. For we dare not make ourselves of the number. Paul saying, I'm saying we don't dare do such a thing. We don't dare make ourselves of the number. Ain't that what people are concerned with? You know, people are concerned with the numbers. You know, God forbid. I said, oh, I got 5,000 video, 5, views on my video. You know, well, big whoop. At the end of the day, if God don't do nothing with it, you don't do nothing with it. But people are concerned with the day of this number stuff. They're not make ourselves of the number. How many followers you got? How many people, how many of your friends, you know, these invisible friends and stuff. And people are so, how much money you got in the bank? You got a 401k, you got your retirement, you got money in the IRAs and the stock funds and the markets. And, I mean, people are concerned. They're obsessed with numbers, numbers. Paul says we dare not make ourselves of the number. Now look at this part. Or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves okay this reminds me of a verse i think in, in psalms i'm going to butcher it i don't know how it goes but david somehow somewhere says, says something along the lines is i envied the wicked i looked at the wicked they were glitzed up they were glamored up they had all this wealth all this stuff they were beautiful people and kings and whatever and rollers and he envied them and, and that david that was david had to repent from that now or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. They commend themselves. They, a lot of people that are like that and, and yet these high following, these high social statuses, the most of the time they're, they're, it's all about themselves. You know, you post selfies. It's all, everything is about themselves. But they measure themselves by themselves. Well, how, how should we measure ourselves? From, by the things of Christ, by the things of the Bible, not of the things, obviously, of the world. They measure themselves by themselves in comparing themselves among themselves, they're not wise. Well, opposite of not being wise is that's foolish. You know, if you're wise, you're a wise guy. Or opposite of that, you're, you're a fool. You're being foolish. And that's like an atheist. Atheist, you know, it's almost like you're denying God in a sense, though. They're not wise comparing themselves among themselves, okay? Now, okay, now what I want to look at real quick here is, you know, the generation that we're living in, it's poison by social media, poisoned by it. And it's poisoned by even news media, whatever, wherever you get your, new, your mainstream and all that, all that, that propaganda, the media, or the, the media poisons people in so many ways. And it's a, it's a reason why they call them social media influencers. You ever hear that term, anybody? You know, uh, they make $50,000 a year because I'm a social media influencer. And I sit down there, I put makeup, I put eyeshadow on, and I, I get all, and I, I mean, that, what do you mean? Make fifty thousand, and you're paying people all this stuff. Another guy, he's he's fat as can be, sits there and eats pizza, stuffs his face, and all that. Guy gets paid for that, <laughs> you know. And it, it, and then they go around driving these nice cars and nice clothes and everything. It's like that's it's insane. But they're social media influencers. Now I looked up the definition of influence. Influence, all right. Webster's eighteen twenty eight. To flow in, literally a flowing in. Okay, referring to a substance, referring to substances spiritual or too subtle to be visible all right like inspiration hence the word was formerly followed into people say you know inspiring inspiration and stuff influencing uh then webster says god hath his influence into the very essence of all things uh there's a couple other de definitions in a general sense 
influence the note's power whose operation is invisible. So I definitely believe there's some type of spiritual power, some type of spiritual strongholds in the thing of social media. Another thing, moral power, power of truth. Ain't that something? Power of truth. So these social media influencers, they want to influence you in a certain way, which most of the time degenerates your morals. For the most part, degenerates your morals. And, uh, and degenerates the power of truth. And you believe their things. It's amazing. I see all these atheists and stuff. You know, I'm going to disprove Jesus in 10 seconds. And he was just saying all these little stupid TikToks and stuff. They try to get you like a, you know, well, Roman Catholicism is really a good thing. And I'm going to tell you why because of church fathers. And people really just believe all this stuff like that. You know, oh, Jesus, he was really just a knockoff of, of some Egyptian god. And, they, and then people, you know, people in high school, people fall for that. See, <laughs> you know, th th this, is, this is the truth and stuff. They get influenced for things of, of the truth. In the wrong way. Um, now, another thing, you know, reason why men obviously are no longer men and women are no longer women is because they are being influenced by certain things. And it, it should be common sense. The more that you saturate your mind with the things of media and the more you saturate your mind, here's a big one, obviously public schools and the study of social studies. And I don't even know how in the world that they, that they infiltrate this stuff about these genders. And a kid, he could choose what he wants to be. When he, the kid, he can't he don't even know what he wants to eat for dinner, let alone what he's going to be the rest of his life. I'm a boy or I'm a girl now or something. I don't know how they crept that thing into the schools, but somehow they did. They did that somehow with all, with, with all that weird stuff. Now, here's something that's interesting to think. I think I've been thinking, obviously, about the whole Pride Month and these you know, people seen walking down the street holding hands, two guys and all that. You know, we're quick to knock the, you know, them LGBTQs and all them. We're quick to knock them over the head. You know, because they, you know, they say, well, God made me this way, and, and I'm quite proud of it. I'm quite happy of it. God, God made them this way, and they're happy about it, okay? Now, yet there, there's children of God, people that are of God, people that are saved, asking the question, why hast thou made me thus? And they get bit up and, bang, and banged up and bitter about it. Why would you make me like this? When, you know, and those people get worked up and marched down the road. God made me this way, and they're so worked up, and they believe a lie, and yet God made us a certain way, and we got all banged up and bitter and depressed about, why hast thou made me thus? <laughs> you know, and yet they believe a lie and march down the road happy about it. You know, don't let them, don't let that whole movement, uh, don't let that whole movement, why are that whole movement going to be happier for how God made them, and not, we're not going to be happy for how God made us? You know, God made us, you know, straight as an arrow and good, you know, church people and, and have decent morals and stuff. And we got to be happy about that. You know, God made, they believe a lie. God, they didn't, God didn't make them that way. You know, you're getting the whole thing of, well, you know, you could say in a sense, God, God made, every, at, at the end of the day, we're all a bunch of sinners. We all have a trait that makes us more susceptible to falling into, I don't know, some people just want to, they want to just steal things or some people want to just tell a lie. It's just like natural and stuff. And. I don't know. I never had an urge or nothing to, to kill people. People have, said I have an urge to, to kill and strangle violence and stuff. People growing up in high school, you ever, ever know them hotheads in high school that are punching walls or getting anger management every other week? Anybody know a couple of them? Predisposed to anger? You know, so I don't know what whole gets all mixed up, mixed up. But most of the time, that stuff's socially influenced and stuff. They get, you know, God made them that way. They use it as an excuse and stuff. Um, so God made you the way that you are. And uh, you may come from a lump of clay, but you got to be happy that you're purchased. Okay, you're, you're, uh, you're God's ball of clay now when you think of it. And um, look, at, uh, look, at, look at Galatians. Here's something that, that we got to think about. You know, obviously our body, it's important to God. Okay, our body's important. In Galatians 5. Our body's important, and, uh, you know, it's so important to God. You know, he, he numbers the hairs on our head, and he subtracts them. <laughs> He adds them and he subtracts them. You know, you get older, you start losing hairs. I guarantee God keeps track of that stuff. So he knows how much hairs you got on your head. Uh, one day, you know, our bodies may go back down to the dirt when we die, but God cares enough for our body, he's going to resurrect that body one day. That This, this ball of dirt ain't even going to stay in the ball of dirt forever. He's going to rearrange all those molecules and fashion it like unto his glorious body. So, uh, you know, there, there's a, something that's particular about our bodies that, that he cares about. But look at Galatians chapter 5. 
Galatians chapter 5, let me see what verse. Um, Galatians chapter 5, look at verse number 24. Galatians 5, 24. Now, church going, Bible believers may not have to worry about drinking and smoking, going out to wrong entertainment and stuff. They may not have to worry about those things. But Bible believers, they got to really watch out for the, you know, the things of, of the affections, things that you love, things that get stirred up in your heart, things that stir you up and move you. And, you know, really what, what gets the, the Bible believing crowd a lot, look at, look at this. Look in church going people and everything, these people, decent morals. Look at Galatians 5 24. They that are Christ's, that'd be us, have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. Put down the flesh and everything that we desire to, to put those things down, to be crucified, to be, to be dead to them. It's conditional. Look at verse 25. If we live in the Spirit, let us also, let us also walk in the Spirit. Look at verse 26. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Let us. Paul's including himself. Let us not be desirous of vain glory. Thinking, oh, you know, in church people are big for that. You go to churches and stuff, they got record attendance and 100 souls saved this week and prayed three hours on the street corner and, you know, uh, and I got Valentine's Day dinners for the couples, drama skits for the rest of the people, children's plays. I got all this all this stuff, built these big works and 15 school school buses and all this. They, they, I don't find all that stuff in the Bible. You know? Well, you got to keep up with the times. You got you to win them somehow. You got to get them in. Well, why didn't Paul tell me to do anything like that? He's, he's giving advice to a young minister, Timothy. Well, all these drama skits and plays. and, and what, what are you going to give people? I don't know, the book? <laughs> I don't know, maybe God's Word? Plays and dinners and skits and dramas and feelings and lights and sound and bands and I mean we got to be careful with some of that stuff in people in the church they get puffed up about vain glory I'm a preacher I'm a pastor I'm a deacon I'm a I'm a you know choir I, I do this I I tithe 10% all, in all this stuff Christians that you know we may not be that, that far out wicked stuff like we just talked about but there's a there's a thing of desirous of vain glory provoking one another look at this envying one another. There goes that, you know, bad fornicator, bad smoking and drinking and cussing and, you know, what about that? People that are envying. Well, Paul said we dare not make ourselves, we don't compare ourselves. One of the things about envy is you get to looking at other people. You get to looking at others. Why hast thou made me like this and you made them like that, you know? You, you, that's, that's no good. You got to watch that, you know, that I think in one of the Bible verses says a root of bitterness may spring up. You better kill that root because that ends up being bitterness. Bitterness to the brethren, to your fellow brothers and sisters in Christ, and then bitterness towards God from those inner things. What is that? All that stuff is inner. There's affections, okay, things you can't really see. You see me, well, oh, look, he's a preacher. He's out there smoking a cigar. Or he's out there drinking. You can see some of those things, but what about envy? You know, there's one of them hidden, one of those hidden things. You know, a lot of churches, they got that whole socialistic, humanitarian gospel. You know, they're just bragging on just vain glory. They're increased with goods, increased with all this. We got this program for this people. We got this for that people. We got certain things directed to this people. We got 50 on the board of directors, and we got that. It's all about just this big works. And I always remember one of the things, you know, Dr. Ruckman always said, you better watch out. A lot of preachers out there, they, idolize, they set up the ministry as an idol. They idolize that thing. And I, you know, I don't want to get like that. Um, you know, you may say, well, you know, you, you, you might, you, know, you, don't, you don't have much talent. Okay, you, well, I'm not talented in, in certain areas and stuff. The Lord gave everybody certain abilities. Let's turn to 1 Peter. I don't care what you say, God of the universe, our Savior, He knows man, He created us from clay, He gave us certain abilities that only you have, that nobody else got. Certain abilities, we're all different. And we ought to be we ought to thank praise the Lord for that, okay? And you say, well, I don't got much talent. Well, give what you got to the Lord. You see, you read that whole parable in the book of the, the talents, and it was talking. It could be two ways on that word, which is interesting, about money or one thing, or if it's about you know about talents, certain certain talents and traits that God gave you with. Um, look at First Peter chapter four here. Look what this says. First Peter chapter four, verse number eleven. Look at this. 
number one, everybody, you know, praise the Lord, God gave us a lot of truth. He helped us out. He helped us understand the Bible and stuff. Um, you know, we ought to speak as the oracles of God. That's a that's a blessing. But look at verse look at first Peter number first Peter chapter four verse eleven. If any man speak, let him speak as the oracles of God. You gotta speak what the Bible says. Be in line with the scripture. If any man minister, let him do it as of the ability which God giveth. You see that? Let him do it as the ability which God gives. God gives everybody a certain ability to minister. You may be able to reach people I can't reach in a, in a lifetime. You may be able to do things for the Lord that nobody else can do. Everybody, God give, give it the ability that God, in all things, here's a good thing, God wants to be glorified in, his, in, his, in people that are in his body, in the body of Christ, that God in all things may be glorified through Jesus Christ, to whom be praise and dominion forever and ever. You could talk about the Lord, talk about the Savior. You could help people. Every, God, God gave everybody the ability to minister. To their certain ability, you know, and I, I like that one story I was reading in uh, one of the Gospels about the woman that put in two mites, and I looked that thing up, that was like one, one, one out of 68th of a cent in our money, that was like nothing, she put in two little mites, and Jesus saw that woman and said, she put in more than the, than the whole people did at the treasury, that poor widow, or whatever, a poor woman cast in two mites, you know, she uh, she gave all, she really gave all she had. That's why really Lord was was uh, was good for that. But people get banged up about money and stuff like that too. You know, I was like this. You know, you give God the first hour of your day, He'll bless your week. You know, give God the first day of the week, He'll bless your month. Here's a good one for us young people. You give God the first years of, of your life, He'll bless your He'll bless your future. I like the sound of that. <laughs> you know, I might never be able to. You know, you gotta give ten percent, give twenty percent. God loveth the cheerful giver, you know, so people get all banged up about, you know, about finances and stuff. There's a lot of things you can do for God to give God. Obviously, the best thing, give, him our, give us our bodies. Present our bodies a living sacrifice. Give what you can to the Lord. I like that verse. She's done what she could, you know. Now, here's now the back to that question. Why hast thou made me thus? Now, a lot of us, some of us should be thinking that and asking that question. Have you ever asked God that question in your life? I'm sure I have. Lord, why, why am I, what is this? Why am I like this? Why, you know, not the, I don't know what it is. I guess as you get older, you start to appreciate the things, that, like the small things, the things of God. Or it just, you really look back and start to appreciate a lot of stuff, which is a, ble which is a blessing. You know, look at, a, look at Revelation chapter 4, 11. And, and, then, and then it makes the, the things that we are going through, may not take them away completely, but they, it makes them bearable. Makes them able to bear those things with, with that spirit of a, uh, Appreciation and not that comparing and and envying and so here's the question: Did you ever did you ever find the answer to that? Why hast thou made me thus? Why did you make me? People, always, that's a that's a big one. Early Christians, young Christians, trying to find the purpose of life. What in the world? Why? What am I here? Fling, you know, getting flung around space, spinning on this earth or whatever, whatever they want to say, or all that. I'm just sitting on this planet Earth. Why did God make me? Look at the answer. Look at Revelation chapter four. Look at verse number eleven. Why hast thou made me thus? Look at Revelation 4, verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For thou hast created all things. That would include me and you. Here's the, here's the answer. And for thy pleasure, they are and were created. The main goal of a child of God's life is to be a pleasure to your creator. Why hast thou made me thus? To please God pretty simple to please God that's why he made us to please him and if you ain't pleasing God you missed the whole one of the big, biggest things of why God even made you to have fellowship with him it's the whole thing it's that we'd be able to commune with him and walk and talk with him like Adam did in the garden to get that fellowship back to, to, to please him that's a, that's one of the greatest verses in the Bible for thy pleasure they are and were created you know people might not appreciate you I'm not out there to please men and please people you know all that but to please the creator and that'll help us you know deal with things and help us treat other people better too no doubt you got that that sense of that that appreciation that sense of i want to do what do whatever to please god that's a big one now i'm gonna end with the last question here i don't got my watch today so I, I i don't know what time it is look at jeremiah 18 look at jeremiah 18 the last question okay hath not the potter power over the clay 
hath not the potter power over the clay? Look at Jeremiah. Well, I don't know. Ask yourself that, does he? Does the potter have power over you? Because we, we established that we're just clay, okay? Now look at this, look at this chapter here. Jeremiah chapter 18. Look at this. Just, just, let me just read this. Jeremiah 18, look at verse number 1. The word which came to Jer Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Arise, go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. Then I went down to the potter's house, and behold, he wrought a work on the wheels. And the vessel that he made of clay was marred in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel, as seemed good to the potter to make it. Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter? saith the Lord, Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. And he goes on, At what instant shall I speak concerning a nation, concerning a kingdom, to pluck it up and to pull it down and to destroy it? That'd be a good one to put on the billboards to wake up America maybe, huh? If that nation, if that nation, notice this, against whom I have pronounced, turn from their evil, I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them. You see that? You know that conditional clause? Well, he, he made that vessel with, with no will to repent. Well, he just said if. So a big one against Calvinism is conditional clauses. That's a good thing to know about how, you know, you know God, God has a certain will, and you could steer the direction of, of, of uh, in a sense, of God's will through his permissive will of, by your choice, the free will of man. Now, there's, now, when I look at this passage, we're going to be done with it. Now, there's some things in here, okay, that, that really will help us Understand the question, hath, hath not the potter power over the clay? Now, the first step that you see down in Jeremiah ver chapter 18, verse number 1, first thing, obviously, he went down. That's a good thing. He went down. Well, well what's the Bible say? For he, for he must increase and I must decrease. Okay? The first step that you got to take for the potter to have power over you is you got to go down. You got to go down. Okay, so there's six things that, I've, that you could see in this passage here. The way, that's down, go down. The words, the works, okay. The, the, uh, the waste, the, so he knocks off some things and chips up and I'll patch that up. I don't like that little piece of, the, of that pie. I, I'm going to redo this, you know. He shapes it up. The works, the waste, um, the wheel, the wheel, and the will. So there's six things that you could you could uh, we could see in this passage here. Now, first off, okay, the way, okay, the way. Now the way, okay, for the potter, okay, to fashion you. Uh, first off, you got to be willing to just go down, and I like how it says the potter's house. You can say, well, that's like the house of the Lord. You know, we got to come to church and you know, got got to fellowship with the brethren and stuff, and you know, go, I got to go down first. You got to be willing to make that initial step. Okay, I'm going to go down. You got to be willing. Um, okay, for that's something that you got to do. Take the necessary step. Okay, then what? And it's interesting. When you go down, what's the first thing that the Lord causes that person to do? Once they do go down, he causes them to hear the words of the Lord. Okay, you got to, you got to go down the way, and you got to hear the words. All right, now, the next thing is the work. Now, what? what now, in order for God to... To, uh, to work on you, okay, not only you got to go down, but then you got to get on the wheel. You got to get on the wheel, okay, and it's, and it's one thing to, you know, a lot of stuff, one thing to just be in the church, and some people, that's just like, that's just how they're, it's just like ingrained. They don't care what church they go to, they don't care what Bible they're using, they don't, I just got to go to church, you know, devote, devote Catholics, devote, devote churchgoers, they go down, you know, they go down to the to, they go down to the potter's house. They go down to the church. They hear the words, but they never get on the wheel. Things don't ever start turning. They're just, you know they don't not, never happens. They just they, they, that's the whole thing on that potter that thing turns okay, and um, you gotta get on the wheel so that the Lord can start forming you into a vessel of honor. Okay, remember there's the vessel of honor, vessel of dishonor. You gotta get on the wheel. Okay, a lot of things you can't just. Big one, you can't just walk into the gym and just sit there and I'm just going to sit down. I'm, gonna, I'm in the gym. Now I'm going to look at this exercise. And he said, I'm going to tell me to do this butterfly. I'm going to sit down. I'm going to read it. Okay, four sets of 15. Um, and I never get on a machine. 
I just sit there and look at it. You imagine that nutcase. He sits there and he's staring at the machine the whole time and just looking around and, you know, man, I wish I didn't envy him. I wish I was like, yeah, look how he's big and, oh, man, look at that. He got muscle. He got big chest and everything. And, you know, then you start envying him. You ain't doing nothing. You ain't getting on the wheel. People don't want to get on the machine, you know, um, stuff like that. You know, if you don't get on the machine, nothing's going to happen. If you don't get on the wheel, okay, you just come down to the potter's house. If you hear the words of the Lord, it may be interesting and stuff, but nothing happens. Nothing, nothing starts spinning. All right, and then next thing uh, about the work, you got the waste in there. You know, the clay was marred in the hand of the potter, so he made it again another vessel which seemed good. The, the, the stuff was marred, okay? And I, and I look at that, like the material, won't it won't yield. So that clay, Lord, I'm on, I'm on here now. I'm on here, but now the stuff is hard to work with. Now, you can get a long thing, a lot of people, because some people were drug up. They, they went through the swamp. They went through the, the miry, murky waters, and other people didn't. You know, but either way, both a blessing. But sometimes that material, for some reason, won't yield to the potter. Okay? And now about that wheel, okay, to get on the wheel, now when it comes down to pottery, I don't know much about pottery, but... I did make a couple little trays I still use today, my little pencil holder. I'm real proud. I always say all the time, babe, look, see how I did this little spiral braided handle here and stuff, like with these colors and all that, and you got little plates and stupid trays and knick-knack stuff, um, little cups and mugs. Um, you know, I'm not no expert, but when it comes to pie, but I, I remember a couple, remember a few things about it. I do know, obviously, you know, when that clay is too hard, the clay's too hard, you can't work with it. So something hard in that clay. What hardens the clay? It's a, a lack of water. Okay, now what do they say? You need more, we got to put more water on this clay, and that clay will be more formable. First thing that comes to my mind, yeah, wow. You know, the, by the, what is he going to present the church, a glorious church, without having spot or wrinkle, by the washing of the water of the word. So you need the word that will help make you be more formable while you're on the wheel. It's like you sprinkle a little more water, just like, a, just like clay. Then, but here's, the, and here's another counterpart of it, though, too. I say, well, you know what? If you have too much water, then you become a muddy mess. You can't work with a stiff brick and form that thing, and you can't work with just a pile of mud. You got too much water. Now, I'm afraid that's what happens in a lot of Bible-believing churches and stuff is, man, we got, we got the deep down. We got the shape of the universe down. We got all these deep. I got, yeah, I know about Calvinism. Yeah, I know how to do about that tongue speaking, a bunch of fake stuff, and eternal security, you know, forget about them Methodists and it, you know, all this stuff, you get, you get well watered with the word, but then, then all of a sudden you get, it's like you get too watered to where nobody can teach you anything no more, and God can't even show you anything no more. <laughs> so you can think about it. You can be underwatered, you ain't going to get formed much. You can be overwatered, and you become, oh, I can't work with this guy. He, he don't even know how to take orders and instructions because he thinks he knows it all. Comes on a job and tells me I got to do it this way and do it this way. <laughs> What do, you, what do you know about, you know, building a foundation? My boss gets tore up for that. These homeowners coming out telling them, I'll do it like this. You know, boss got to come sometime, put the foot down. You go back inside and do your insurance. <laughs> you know, he tells them flat out. You, you know a thing about, about grades and all that? No, you don't. So go back, you know, go back in and do what you know what, what you're doing. But the, that's the whole thing. You think you know it all. I know all this Bible. I'm well watered. And then no, nobody could ever show me or, or teach me nothing. That's no good. The potter ain't going to be able to use that either. It'd be a muddy mess. And the thing about mud is, you go, oh, okay, I'll take the mud. I'll form a nice little cup. It holds its shape maybe for a little bit. You may hold your shape sitting here in this pew, and then you walk out the door and you just melt. <laughs> uh, he, he didn't last long. He didn't hold long, you know. Uh, he looked like a cup for a little bit, muddy mess. Next thing you know, it just fell down. So you got to watch out for that, that there's contrast of the watering of the word. That's why I look at that with that whole watering stuff. But that's the whole thing with clay, okay? You know, if all you did was just get watered and watered and watered, you'd drown. And I like that Bible, that verse in the Bible, you know, eat as much honey as is sufficient for thee. You know, and honey is like another word of God. Take as much Bible, you know, I, I might not be able to read 15 chapters a day, like Dr. Sam Gibb could or something. Bless him, bless his soul, he could. I might not be able to read 15 chapters, but you better read something. You better get something. What if you all you get, you read one verse a day. You better meditate on that verse. Think about, Lord, what is this verse? You know, you might, you might only read one verse a day. You gotta get something. Eat as much honey as sufficient for thee. You know. Then I think it says, "Lest thou be filled and they'll vomit it up." I think in the book of Proverbs or one of the books. Um, so you gotta have that balance, okay? Now, the next thing 
okay, about the pottery, okay, one of the hardest things about, you know, spinning and making anything is keeping that piece of clay thing on the center of the wheel. Because that thing has to be centered. Everything has to be centered or else it's lopsided and it's wobbly or whatever. So not only you got to have to ask, you know, you have to ask, are you on the center of the wheel? You know, uh, the center of the wheel, not just, yeah, I made it down to the potter's house. Uh, you know, I'm hearing the words, I'm watered. I think I'm more, before I'm going to get onto this, this, this wheel, but I'm not quite on the wheel. I'll be a little bit off center. I'll be wobbling, you know, to and fro a little bit. So there's one of the things about pottery is you got to be on the center of the wheel, okay, whatever we can get from that. Um, okay, do you have enough water? Do you have enough water? You getting watered with the word enough? Do you got too much water? You know, I look at that thing like, 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 uh, you know, let God work a work in you. Then, yeah, we got to be hearers of the word, but then doers also of the word. You get so much water, next thing you know, you kill the plant. You know, so that's crazy though to think about, but it happens. There's people, them theologians, they they just sit there, they just study, just book on top of book and book. That's why they get so they get so far out and all. They don't they don't like to talk about Christ at all. They don't want to. They're just so theological, so just just bracketed and just you know, scholarly and, and all that stuff. You got to watch out for that too. So you got the wheel, okay? And then, and then obviously the next thing with the, the close association with the wheel is like his will. Look at Romans chapter 12 real quick. I'm almost done. Look at Romans chapter 12. Now, how much of your life has God done? And how much have you done? <laughs> you know? How much, how much have you actually sat back and let God do some things and work some things out or you do the things look at Romans chapter 12 I mean I'm all guilty of something like that look at look at Romans chapter 12 uh, verse number 2 be not conformed to this world Romans 12 2 no, I like that we're talking about the pottery we ought to be conformed that potter forming us not to be formed by the social media influencers and by the government and the political parties and all that, you know, stuff to get you strung into the world, but be conformed, but be ye transformed. So you may be, you may have been like that. I might, I might have been like that, no doubt about it, before I was, uh, before I was saved, been conformed to the world. But then I said, Lord, I got to get back on the wheel. I got, you got to help me. I got to, I don't like this. I don't want nothing to do with it. I got to get back on the wheel and he'll slowly knock this off, chip this off. Yeah, I'll patch this up and I'll, I'll transform you. That's, that's the power of transformation. You be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. When I look at the perfect will of God, I think I'm on the center of the wheel. That's hard. I mean, you're doing it, you're doing it at the right time, at the right place. I mean, things are right in line. You know, there are all, kind of, all kinds of illustrations with that. You know, he was supposed to be a, he's supposed to be a preacher and teacher, but he's singing choir and he was singing choir. He's supposed to be a preacher, or you know, all whatever, you know, a couple of stuff like that. Or he was supposed to be a, a doctor, and he ended up being a, you know, I don't know. He ended up being a carpenter or whatever. The perfect will of God. Now, good. Yeah, he's doing some good stuff. Okay, acceptable. Yeah, okay, I accept it, but it's not quite the perfect will of God. Now, the perfect will of God is being right on that center of the wheel and allowing God to have for, full control of situations. That's a big one. Now, um, you know, God makes you and molds you according to his will, okay? And uh, think about it. God wants your body. Like it says in that Romans 12, verse 12, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is a reasonable service, holy. That's something we ought to, we ought to think about in these days, to be, to be holy, you know, especially when we get to, you know, comparing and stuff and, um, Holiness is, is, is what is from God. That's something we gotta know. Holiness is from God. You could put on looks and people talk about modesty and you could fake all that modesty stuff. Have everything right, but holiness, that's that's where true beauty is. That's that that's good stuff. Now, and every, now you think about it, everybody might have our own we all have our own personal problems, personal troubles that we that we deal with. And it may be replying against God. You know, it may not be like the unbelievers reply against God, but I know I may be, I've said it too in my lifetime. You know, why hast thou made me thus? Okay. It may be, it comes from insecurities. 
troubles, okay, where everybody got their own. Bitterness, envyings, um, jealousies, carnal, fleshy comparisons, making ourselves of a number. Um, those are the things which us clean, us clean Christians got to watch out for. Those are the things that you're going to have trouble with. The devil will use them and try to work you over on that. There's the verse in, in Hebrews chapter 12 real quick. Let's turn there real quick. Almost done. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Now, you know, consider those, you're those, those things that you got, the personal troubles that you got, insecurities, bitterness, envies, jellies, jellies. <laughs> I, got, I had a trouble with jelly donuts today. I'd take two of them. That's one of my troubles. <laughs> okay. They brought donuts. I ate two of them. And three cups of coffee, too, while I'm at it. <laughs> but anyways, um, consider those things, okay, those inward things, okay, jealousies and carnal comparisons. Consider those your fiery trials, which are what? To try your faith. I mean, they may not be like the fiery trials that the Christian martyrs had back in the day. Thank God when you're going through something like that. But you deal with certain personal troubles. And God's using that, what? To maybe to try testing you, to trial your faith. To say, yeah, get back. Get, let me take over control. Get back on the, down to the potter's house and get back on the wheel and stuff, you know. Let me work with you. That's what he wants to do. Because look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. And obviously God can't work with a piece of clay that has a, a root stuck in it. you got to get that root out. Look at Hebrews chapter 12. Look at verse number 15. Look at this one. Hebrews 12, 15. Look in. Well, I like even verse 14. Here's a good one. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God, Look at this, lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled. That bitterness starts, and it troubles you. That thing ended up getting Esau in big trouble, profane person and stuff. Looking diligently, lest the root of bitterness, and that, that root of bitterness, you questioning God, if that's what we're talking about tonight, questioning God, that root of bitterness may spring up because, you know, because of insecurities and in. in and questioning God, why, why did you make me a certain way? And uh, I'm going to close with one last illustration. Okay, for us that maybe aren't familiar with clay and pottery and stuff, maybe we're familiar with vehicles and cars or whatever. Now, you know, if, you're, if you want the power of God upon your life, think of it like a car. Okay, Jesus Christ, got he's got to have the wheel. He's got to be behind the wheel, Jesus Christ, of your life. And look, it don't do you no any good if you're just sitting over there in a passenger seat. Because if you're over in the passenger seat, you're going to be reaching over to the Lord and saying, you know, you're going to be like, well, you'll be grabbing a wheel for him. Okay, so it doesn't do you no good to, to go over in the passenger seat. Well, it doesn't do you any good either if you're just in the back seat of the car. Because you'll be a backseat driver. You're telling the Lord, Lord, stop here. Lord, turn here. Lord, go this way. No, don't go over there. Go this way. So it don't do you any good being in the back seat of the car. Okay, so then what are you going to do? You gotta literally get over, you gotta just keep that car in parked, walk around to the back of the car, tell Jesus to come out there with you, and and open up that door of the trunk, okay? Open up the trunk, get in the trunk, have Jesus shut the door, throw him out the keys, and you tell the Lord, look, Lord, you fill this car up with whatever you wanna fill it up with, put whatever you wanna put in it, and just take me wherever you're going. I'll, I'll be back here just waiting, <laughs> okay? That's kind of being in the perfect will of God. Not as much as being in the passenger seat, not as much as being in the back seat, but you almost got to be in the trunk of the car. And that's the thing with some of us, though. You know, I, I look at it, praise the Lord, I don't believe I got the wheel of my life at all, the, uh, that I'm behind the wheel controlling every single bit of my life. You know, I would like to think, man, I'm not even in the passenger seat. But here's the trouble, okay? I'm back here in the back of the car just talking with Jesus. Let me be praying with him, talking with him. Help me out reading the Bible and just talking with him. I'm stalling him. Like I don't really want to get in the trunk. And there may be times in my life where I might, I might put, one foot, put, put one foot in the trunk. And then I grab his arm and say, well, hold on, wait. Let, let's just talk a little bit longer here. <laughs> you know, I'm just praying a little bit longer. Lord, just, I, you sure you know how to drive or something like that? You, sh you sure you know where, where you're going? You, I, can, I, can I trust you while well, I'm stuck in this trunk back here? And you're in <laughs> complete control. And that's where some of us are at. We got maybe got one leg on the, one leg in the trunk, 
one leg out of the trunk. Some of us, some of us, geez, I God, God forbid, I hope not. We're behind the wheel. Jesus should be behind the wheel. But there's that, there's that, that process, that step. And you know, and if we go back to the whole thing about you know the 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 potter and the clay, that's the whole thing is to be in the will of of, of God. And I think about Jesus. I think about you know, he said in Luke twenty two forty two, saying, "Father, if thou be willing, remove this cup from me." Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. And, uh, you know, that the, the, the Lord was all about um, not his own will. He came down to save us, okay? And, you know, I, I like that whole thing just, um, just with the whole Garden of Gethsemane. You know, Adam, you know, he may, he, he may have had his garden and dealt with his tree. And, and from, that, from that right there came the, the, the will of man. And then Jesus Christ, he came down and dealt with his tree and end up end up saving our souls and reversing the curse that happened to us. But um, just think about the will, the will of God to be on the wheel. Now, I just want to close with just, you know, if you if you do begin to reply against God, you know, saying, why hast thou made me thus? There's some things you got to do. Remember that you're just a piece of clay saved by the grace of God. Um, get off your high horse, maybe thinking you deserve better than what God's doing. Um, you could be in a lot worse shape than you think you are. Okay, when you start comparing, you're, it, it, there's something wrong about that mindset. You could be in a lot worse shape. You could be struggling with real persecution from the government, real persecution from being disowned from fam your families and stuff like that and getting killed. You could be in worse shape with wars. So what you got to do, what we all got to do, talking to myself here too, is got we got to go down to the potter's house, hear his words, with the right amount of water, and let him let him do the work. You know that's why it's it's about the fruit of the spirit. Let God work through you. You know, and um, get on the get in the center of the wheel, and obviously in the center of His will. So think about that last question: Hath not the potter power over the clay? And I, I hope he I hope I hope he'd have power over us. So let's just bow our heads for closing prayer. All right, dear Lord God, Heavenly Father, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Dear God, we just thank you, Lord, that what you did in the garden, Lord, and what you, what you did on the cross, that, what you said, Lord, not, not my will, but thine be done. Lord, uh, what an example uh, that you left us, dear God. Um, you forsook so much, so much for us, Lord. Um, you done you done all for us, Lord. And I like that song. What, what have we done for you, Lord? I pray that you help us, give us a, a yielding spirit, dear God, to um, just to push us, Lord. Use even circumstances in our life, Lord, to allow us to go down, lower us, Lord. Um, just to to get the word, Lord. We thank you for watering us, dear God, giving us all kinds of truth, Lord. And uh, we we bless you, dear God, for the water that you that you uh, gave us, Lord. And just help us that it's not too much, Lord. Allow us to have a, a, a right spirit that, that we can still learn things. And we can still be humble and obedient. And just um, help us, Lord, find the, find the will that, that's pleasing to you, Lord. And you gave everybody sitting here in this room, everybody has certain abilities. And you made them, Lord, a certain way. You created them a certain way, Lord. Uh, like, we ought to be happy for how you created us, Lord. Not like that, like, not like that crowd that believes that God that you made them how they are, and yet they're happier than us. That ought not to be the case. Lord, we just love you, and we thank you, dear God. Cover us all in your blood. Be with us throughout the rest of this rest of this week. In Jesus' name, Amen. All righty, verse memorization. We're gonna do. We're gonna do probably. Uh, yeah, Revelation four eleven. It's a great verse.